T Live and Ken Rosenthal joining us right now on Stadium. Ken, how you doing? And I mean, I want to start where we just left off with the San Diego Padres because I wanted to make sure I don't misquote you. Obviously, you're on here a lot. Did you say at one point earlier this year that like you've maybe heard some things where the clubhouse is not great, but nothing that you could truly report? I've heard various things about that clubhouse throughout the season, up, down, this, that. I don't know exactly what's going on there and what has gone on there. I saw Juan Soto's quote from last night basically saying they quit on the series. I'm paraphrasing. It wasn't exactly that way, but that's essentially what the gist was. They've had a number of team meetings, player meetings, players only, and it just seems that for whatever reason they cannot get it going. Now, I can say this with some confidence having covered a lot of losing teams in my career when a team is losing when it's going through what the Padres are going through underperforming well below expectations there are going to be some things going on in the clubhouse so I'm confident there are some things going on in the clubhouse I just don't know exactly what they are okay so let's swing it to Philadelphia uh, main event from last night Michael Lorenzen with the no-hitter, and we can get to the trade component in a moment. But let's start with one part that I left out from the top because I wanted to save it for you because you've talked about it on Fair Territory and wrote about it in The Athletic. Are Philly fans getting a little soft? Like, they suddenly love their ball players. You're new. You're struggling. Let's standing ovation for this guy. And Lorenzen pointing it out, pointed it out. He's like, I've never seen a crowd like this. And he referred to the trace situation from the weekend. Well, on Fair Territory and in what I wrote today, I was having a little fun. So let me give you some background. I went to school in Philadelphia, and I also worked there, or actually right outside, which is where I lived, in South Jersey for a couple of years. So I've got a good familiarity with the city. And what I wrote was, when I was in school, once drove to the vet, the old vet, with New York plates, going to a Giants-Eagles game, and people were throwing stuff at the car. Early in my career... I covered a game, one of the first baseball games I ever covered for my paper in New Jersey. They sent me on the day that Mike Schmidt took the field in a shoulder-length wig and sunglasses because he had told a Canadian reporter that the Philly crowd was a mob scene, uncontrollable, beyond help. So those quotes came out. He knew he was going to get heat, and he took the field like that. So what I wrote was, that's the Philly I know. This Philly with giving standing ovations to a struggling $300 million player. That is a bit out of character. Last night, much different. Guy's throwing a no-hitter. Of course, the fans are going to be on his side. But I was just having fun with it. And, hey, I even go back to last year when I wrote that I didn't think firing Joe Girardi would solve the Phillies' woes. Obviously, that was proven wrong. Philly fans, from the moment that came out through the end of the World Series and to this day, Still give me grief about it. All well and good. Hey, they were right, and I was wrong. So the Philly I know is this rough and tumble, demanding place, and now it seems to me it's a little softer. Ken, the trade, obviously, for Lorenzen pays off, but they did it last year. They made some smaller moves that that got them to the World Series. Is Dave Dombrowski not getting enough credit as the GM that can go into an organization – Yes, he destroys the farm system, but he also gets you to World Series, and he's won a few. From the Marlins, he didn't win in Detroit, but the Phillies he got there, the Red Sox, right? He's Is he the best at this, and does he deserve more credit, or, or are Philly fans going to be booing him soon? Actually, AJ, it seems to me that he gets a lot of credit for doing just what you described. He can get a team to where it wants to be, whether it's the playoffs, the World Series. Obviously, the World Series title is the ultimate goal. He is excellent at that. He knows how, in the words of one of his former assistants, how to top off a team. And he does that at extremely high levels. He is a winner. Now, yes, it can disrupt the farm system. That's sometimes the price you pay. But if the goal is to win the World Series and you want to hire one executive today, I would say that Dave Dombrowski would probably be the guy you hire. I would expect that he's going to the Hall of Fame, and deservedly so. So... Does he get the credit he deserves? Maybe not, because GMs generally don't get that kind of notoriety. But he certainly deserves it, because he has done that, done it repeatedly, and won it in a number of places now. 
Well, Dave is technically the president, not the GM, so you can't right. take Sam Fold's <laughs> title <laughs> away from him. Um, I apologize, Sam. Yeah, Sam, Sam's upset about that. But <laughs> is this how other teams should have acted at the break? Like, we call for even, – even Scotty B said, hey, you know, this trade deadline was kind of meh. You know, we call for these big splashes. Should teams know how to supplement, or do you think other teams – tried to supplement, and they just didn't get this much immediate success out of it. <laughs> Angels. Well, part of the problem was the supply of quality players was so limited. And invariably, in that kind of situation, some teams are going to get shut out. Now, what's interesting about this deadline so far is that some of the teams that didn't do much have been okay. The Mariners traded their closer. They're doing really well. And then some of the teams that have gone all in – the Angels being the classic example, they have not done okay. And we've seen this variance occur, and it kind of leads you to a nowhere place when evaluating the deadline. Some teams are better off doing what they did, and some teams are better off having done nothing or even sold. It's odd, and it's kind of hard to put your finger on. Now, the Cubs, if you look at them, they decided not to sell and went out and bought Candelario and the reliever Kuas. They've done better for it. I know they just lost a series in New York, but they have been where you'd want to be as a buyer. So it's kind of hard to judge just yet where these teams are. I mean, the Padres bought and it hasn't worked. It's two weeks since the deadline, not even two weeks. Let's see how it all plays out. But there have been some odd things occurring so far. Seattle, to me, is maybe the oddest. That's a team that you trade your closer you don't really do anything else. You would think that's a problem. Now, I know they got some guys from Arizona they liked, but yet they've continued on what really started about a month ago. It's a much better play. Cincinnati did not do enough. Well, they've paid for it. Miami did quite a bit. They were struggling for a bit. <laughs> it's hard to know. Okay, so on the topic of odd, um, I'd like to take us to the Orioles and not the broadcast situation. That's been covered at length on this show. Um, is there space available at Camden Yards coming up for us to potentially rent it out and use it for FT Live or anything else since apparently that gorgeous ballpark is being somewhat rejected by John Angelos unless they build him uh, Disneyland around it? Well, Scott, the way the situation works right now is they have a lease and it expires December 31st. They've yet to negotiate a new lease, even though at the moment that lease is completed, they are going to get from the state of Maryland $600 million. You would think that might be enough. But John Angelos, who is the managing chairman of the Orioles right now, and the governor of Maryland, Westmore, have talked about, both of them have talked about, doing in the immediate surrounding area of Camden Yards kind of what the Braves did in Atlanta. The problem is the land for that does not exist. And maybe you could do some little things, maybe build a garage in one of those parking lots to create more space. You have vertical garage going upward and maybe there's more room somewhere else. But it seems to me that that's a real problem. And John Angelos has been pretty clear. He'd like to replicate the Battery Atlanta. He wants to do some things around the ballpark to enhance the whole experience. He wants to make money like the Braves are making money down there. I don't see, from what I've been told, how that is going to be possible. It certainly is not possible in the same way. The Battery Atlanta takes up 60 acres. There's not 60 acres around Camden Yards. It's in the middle of a city. So what he's holding out for is not exactly clear. What he wants out of all this is not exactly clear. But I will tell you this. There aren't a lot of professional sports teams in this country right now that are getting $600 million in public money and having that available to them merely by signing a lease. The Ravens had the same deal, the NFL Ravens. They signed a lease in January, I believe, a long-term lease to 2037, and they got their money for stadium upgrades. That's what the $600 million is for, ballpark upgrades. I don't know where this is going. The reason I wrote what I did yesterday is because I hear that it's not going smoothly, despite the governor and John Angelos repeatedly saying, all is well. If all was well, that lease would be signed by now. It's August. They've got till December 31st. At one point, John Angelos had said he hoped to get this done by the All-Star break. That is not happening, has not happened. And 
Everyone around this situation does expect it to get done, but if you followed Leangelo's family over the years, both John and his father, Peter, Peter, of course, the owner of the team for so long, he's been incapacitated since 2018, these guys can protract negotiations like few others, and it seems that that is what is going on. Okay, in your article you said, like, there's some, like, Angelos had given to Moore's campaign. I think it was Moore's campaign. Yes. And also to the Democratic, you know, kind of like a fund that also funded Moore's campaign. Doesn't there seem to be a need for a little more transparency? Or or am I just asking for wind here? Am I, am I grasping at straws? Because it just doesn't seem like there's enough transparency ever with Angelos. But well, in like a stadium situation. In this case, Eric, I just pointed that out in the article because it shows the relationship between these two. And they have a close relationship. Now, those numbers are accessible to the public. It's not as if they're hiding them. The $6,000 that he gave to Moore's campaign is the maximum allowed under election law. So from that perspective, I don't know that anything's being hidden. But the point I made in the article is I don't know that Wes Moore is going to undercut John Angelos publicly if indeed there are problems behind the scenes, as others have indicated, when John Angelos was a campaign donor. Hey, Ken, do you feel like this is a trend in Major League Baseball? I've heard about this where owners are essentially jealous of the Braves. It's worked out so well. They basically buy all of the land around them. You create a mini city. And I don't know all the details here, so I could be a little off, but whatever. Um, you can take losses on buying things and take losses on the team and then split it up. There's a lot of fancy uh, business work to be done here and a ton of money to be made. So every owner is looking and going, I can create a massive new revenue stream. The Cubs have done this to an extent too. Yeah. And it's a much nicer area. Cardinals. Do you feel Cardinals, yes. Do you feel like that's a trend and that's a jealous owner here? Also just seeking out an opportunity where he can perhaps not only make his franchise a lot more money on the short term, but eventually you figure hopefully he sells. The Johns both hopefully sell Fisher and Angelo someday to save us all. So do you think, do you feel like that's a, a business thing going on in this sport in particular? Because you have more volume in terms of baseball games? Yes. And I don't know if jealousy is the right word, Scott, but an owner in Baltimore sees an owner in Atlanta doing what he's doing or what they are doing. It's a Liberty Media entity that owns the team. And sure, they want to duplicate exactly that experience because it does create a lot of revenue. And in Baltimore, I will say this for John Angelos, he does have a feel for the city, does have a desire to make the city a better place. And it's gone backwards a little bit downtown in recent years. And that's part of his motivation. There's no question about it. But does he want to make money? You bet he wants to make money. And you mentioned the Cardinals. They've done it. The Red Sox have talked about revitalizing the area around Fenway a little bit, if I'm not mistaken. All teams would love to do this. Sometimes it's achievable. Sometimes it's more difficult. It just seems to me from the people I've spoken with that around Camden Yards, unless you give the Orioles those parking lots to build on, which the state is not going to do, the Ravens have rights to those parking lots as well. I don't know how this gets done. Ken, question for you, because we're talking about this, and uh, I live in Chicago, so I'm familiar with Wrigleyville and all the, the bars and stores around uh, Wrigley that the Ricketts family has put up. A lot of, and this could be just a rumor, uh, this is just kind of fans that I hear talking or friends who still go to games and stuff, when the pandemic hit in around 20 and all those years where all those bars were closed and not making money, do you think that – how much of a effect do you think that had in the Ricketts' decision to maybe, hey, not not extend these guys right now or we can't afford to to pay these big contracts and we're going to rebuild for a few years because also I've been losing money on all the bars and everything around there too? Well, at the time during the pandemic, I believe, or maybe shortly after, Tom Ricketts was quoted as saying the losses that the Cubs sustained were biblical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Biblical. yeah or, just, or just him. The, right. The Cubs are doing just fine. All yeah. major league teams now are doing just fine. You cannot promote how much your attendance is up every week, which baseball is doing, and rightly so, and say that the sport is in financial trouble or that you're in financial trouble as an owner. No one is going to buy it. No one should buy it. No one ever should have bought it. At the same time, it has influenced the way teams have operated, and certain teams are not as willing to spend anyway as much as others. And I'm Excluding Cohen from this conversation because he's on another level. The Cubs are in a position where 
They've kept their team together. They've added to that team. And now in the offseason, they will again be under scrutiny because it is time for them to go forward. Time yep. for them to take the next, next step to becoming not just a contender, but a potential World Series team. And Bellinger will be one benchmark there, but he's a Scott Boris client. And we know that most Scott Boris clients, if not the vast majority, generally go for the highest dollar figure. And maybe the Cubs don't have that. Maybe the Colorado Rockies bid $1 more, and that's that. Could happen. But if not Bellinger, if not Stroman, then who else? And there are other free agents, not so much on the offensive side, but certainly on the pitching side, that will be available. Ken, let's just say this goes nuclear in, ba- in Baltimore, okay? And somehow, some way, this doesn't happen, which I feel like this is one of the biggest stories we're talking about for no reason because there's no way it doesn't. They don't sign some sort of a lease. Where do the Orioles play? This is all. This is why I think it's all bullshit. Because the Orioles aren't going to play somewhere else. They're well, going to play in Camden Yard, so they're going to get a lease signed. So I feel like we're talking about this. Were they not going to play in Baltimore? They got no, nowhere else did. to go. So it feels like to me the city has all the power. Not only does the city have all the power, they're holding and saying, oh, Angelos, you guys are super greedy. You want every dollar. You won't pay your players. Here's $600 million dollars. We give you, I feel like this is all the Angelos is saying, no, we want more. We want more because we're the Angelos and we deserve more. Screw that, dude. If I'm Baltimore, if I'm the Maryland governor, I'm like, okay, call my bluff and go play somewhere else and get back to me. AJ, I'm glad you raised that point because in the article, I believe it was the second paragraph, I said no one expects them to leave. And let me preface all of what I'm about to say with this comment that, because of the Colts leaving in 1985, that city is still kind of scarred. Now, younger people don't remember, of course. It's almost 40 years ago. But I worked there for a long time, and that is always on people's minds. So that is why this gets people nervous, fans nervous. But at the same time, there is almost no doubt that they will stay in Baltimore. The commissioner, Rob Manfred, has said repeatedly, he said it, at the winter meetings, and he said it again at the All-Star break, that team is not leaving. John Angelos has said this team is not leaving, that Fort McHenry will be standing as long as this team is here, something along those lines. They're not leaving. And I agree with you. Your basic point, he lacks leverage. I don't see where he is going to be able to stomp and kick his feet and raise heck and get what he wants here. He may get some of it because it might be in the cities and states' interest to develop that area if they can do it. But absolutely, he is really operating without much leverage. And that's going to factor into this whole thing. And ultimately, I agree with you, AJ. It's all talk right now. It's all smoke. But the fact that we are less than five months out and there's still no lease, well, it's a story for sure. And you wonder just exactly how this is going to turn out. Yeah, that's good stuff. Uh, One comment from our, our chat, TJ said, Cardinals, Braves, Cubs, they're real estate companies with a baseball team. It's a <laughs> Good line. Every team, listen, I think every team you ask. They want to be if they're they not. They all want to be it. You think, I can, listen, I know for a fact the White Sox would love to develop around whatever it's called now, guaranteed rate field. Yeah, there's but a lot of nothing around there. Of, but because of the way it's zoned, they can't. Yeah. There's so many hurdles you have to jump over. And the Braves were smart. We, were, we played in Turner. And they're like, our fans are in North. Most of them drive through the city. Oh, there's, what is it, 60 acres they bought? And they paid yes. for it yes. and said, we're going to take these 60 acres and make what we want. They built then, a city, they, and it's awesome. Then so, the, Cardinals, the Cardinals and then the Cubs have done a great job with what the, the land they had. Mm-hmm. So give these teams credit. Yeah, the other owners are jealous. Why? Because they didn't fucking think about it. You're right. You're right. And for everyone else, because we got to go, um, you can Google Artie Moreno and uh, what he tried to do out there. <laughs> have a good time with that. Ken, great to talk to you. A little biz talk this week. I like it. We'll catch you again uh, next week. Thanks, guys. Thank you. That was fun. I like that. I mean, I, I, you know, worked for the league for a long time. I never get to talk like that. So it's cool to go over the business side of what's going on here. You know, you're an Orioles fan. You should know what this business is made of. Fair Territory with Ken Rosenthal every Monday on YouTube, Spotify, Apple. 